أعوذ بالله السميرة من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا عن الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So the interesting thing about this session is that uh, when I when I got my list of topics and my sessions, this was the this was the one that I kind of crossed and I was like, okay, this is the one that I really can't wait to speak on. Subhanallah, I've been at it since three o'clock and so. I really don't feel like speaking right now, so <laughs> but I'm very passionate about this subject. Very, very, very passionate about this subject because I think that anyone that has worked with Muslim youth, and actually, you know, believe it or not, it's not just Muslim youth, it's with everybody. You find that people are really, really insecure. People are really insecure. So I tell parents this all the time. When parents come up to me and, they, and they're, they're all upset about their kids because they spend money on expensive shoes and on expensive clothes and stuff like that, and you know, they're, they're, they're falling to the peer pressure around them. I'm like, well, you guys do the same thing, except instead of shoes and clothes, you put on $100,000 weddings because your cousin put on a $100,000 wedding and you have to buy a certain house and drive a certain car. You're just as insecure as your kids are, right? So let's face it, people have a lot of insecurity and people constantly feel a need to impress those around them. And I feel really bad because I haven't heard what, what Sister Dalia had to say or what, what uh, most of what Dr. Altaf had to say um, and so I'm, I'm sure that I might be repetitive. But one thing I want to say from the start, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands how important reputation is to people, how important image is to people. And that's why Allah azza wa jal has made it so sacred, sanctified, that you should not harm anyone else's image and not harm anyone else's reputation. Allah knows how bad it is to feel that sense of insecurity. And so for you to contribute to the insecurity of another person is so rigorously condemned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that it's, it's likened to killing somebody. You know, subhanAllah, when Allah Azza says in, about backbiting in Surah Al-Hujurat, Would one of you like to eat his, his dead, or the meat of his brother dead? And what that means is, subhanAllah, some of the ulama, they said, what's the point of saying mayta, dead, right? Some of them said, because when you backbite, when you slander, you, it's, you might as well kill that person. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, on, the, on the night of Al-Asra' al-Mi'raj, one of the sites that he saw were people that were scratching their faces off with copper nails. It was a very horrific sight. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was horrified by it. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked what that was, he was told that those are the people that used to backbite. And in essence, just as you remove people's ability and comfort to show their faces in society, Allah Azza wa Jalla allows, will, will cause you to remove your face on the Day of Judgment, literally. So it's so sanctified in the punishment for slander, the punishment for backbiting, the punishment for, for, for harming someone's face in society. And that's why the way that we even make up for that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us what? That you speak good of that person in front of people, as you spoke evil of them, you should speak good of them, you should restore their image in society. So Allah Azza wa Jal understands how important it is for us to be able to, to be comfortable and even confident. Uh, and what Allah condemns obviously is arrogance and insecurity. But Allah Azza wa Jal understands, and that's why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has made people's arud, their honor and their dignity so sanctified. And we see this all the time, right? Now I'm sure this might have been brought up, but you know, young girls that will commit suicide, because you know images that they texted to their to, to their boyfriends got you know got all around and their reputations were ruined and they no longer felt a reason to live, and that's just what it is in in, in this society, where you're constantly ex you're constantly forced to express yourself, express yourself through Facebook, express yourself through Twitter, express yourself through Instagram, express yourself in school, express yourself in the masjid, express yourself at the convention, express yourself at the family gathering, express yourself at weddings, express yourself at this, express yourself at that. You're constantly forced to be expressing and to be showing something, right? And subhanAllah, you know, I think often of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that the worst of people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are dhul wajhain, people of two faces. Someone who comes to one group of people with a face and then goes to another group of people with another face. I'm like, subhanAllah, in the world we live in today, people have 20, 30 faces, not two faces, right? You have, you're expressing yourself constantly at the world through all these different means. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is am I secure in my own skin? A very interesting discourse that I once read uh, and uh, usually when you read about Ibn Tila, when you read about tests and trials, you read about the test of wealth and the test of, of you know, fame and things of that sort. And Imam bin Qutaymi, rahimahullah, he actually had a chapter, the test of al-jamal, the test of beauty. 
He considered beauty to be a test, a trial for a person. Why? Because look, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, the way that your nose is positioned and the way that your eyes are positioned and that mole that, that's somewhere here or wherever it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that perfectly and Allah gave you just the right amount of attraction or lack thereof. It's a test. Because when people are too beautiful, what do they become? They become shallow. Most of the time they become shallow. They become arrogant. They're more likely to fall into zina and things of that sort with people throwing themselves at them. Beauty is even considered a test by the ulama because it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, and all of you are thinking, yeah, that, that is my test, you know. I'm <laughs> Man, why did Allah make me so beautiful, right? I can see all of you nodding your heads. So I guess I don't need to be talking to y'all about security, but... Um, how did the Prophet ﷺ deal with this? People not feeling good about themselves. What you find consistently from the Messenger ﷺ is that he would tell people to worry about how they seen or looked in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as simple as that. I know my time is short. Every time the Prophet ﷺ addressed someone with low self-esteem, he mentioned their image in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of you have seen the video, The Ugliest Sahabi? Raise your hand. If you haven't seen it, please go YouTube it. And ugliest is in quotations because none of the Sahaba are ugly, of course. But you read about the stories of those who, who actually, uh, Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, Zahir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the companions, and how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa boosted their self-esteem. Please go watch the video, inshallah, because I don't have time to go through the story of Julaybib. It's incredibly powerful. Julaybib means the deformed one. And what the Prophet, the lengths that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went to to make sure that Julaybib felt valuable. Zahir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who the Prophet sallallahu grabbed him in the marketplace, in the souq, and he, you know, and he started to, to wrestle with him. And Zahir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that when I realized it was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I actually put my back closer to his chest because it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Who wouldn't want the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to hug them and to, and to wrestle with them? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa jokingly was saying, man yashtari hadha al-abd, man yashtari hadha al-abd, who will buy this slave? Who will buy this slave? And Zahir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, even if I was a slave, who would want to buy me? You see how low of a self-esteem he has? Who would want to purchase me, even if I was a abd? And Zahir radiallahu anhu says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he turned me around, and he put his, his hands on my shoulders, and he smiled, and he said, But you are priceless in the sight of Allah. Why are you worried about what other people think? Why are you, why are you down on yourself? Now, do you think for a moment, just connecting it to what I wrote, what I said about Ibn Qutayba rahimahullah and his writing on the test of beauty, do you think for a moment Zahid would want to come back to this world and be, you know, really handsome and really good looking? Or would he be satisfied with what the Prophet ﷺ did for him that day and what the Prophet ﷺ said about him? Maybe it was the humility that came from his test and trial of not being so attractive. But Rasulullah ﷺ reminded him what? You're priceless in the sight of Allah. Why do you care what people think of you? And Rasulullah would, would, would randomly test the Sahaba. You know, and, and one of the things, uh, Anas radiallahu anhu, he says, the Prophet was sitting with us one time, and the Prophet saw a man who was walking, and mashallah, he's handsome, he's rich, he's famous, he's got everything. Rasulullah says, what do you say about this person? Khalu, ya Rasulullah, they said, ya Rasulullah, this man, uh, if he speaks, everyone listens. I know some, this was the inspiration episode that came out, episode 8. Shameless plug-in, right? Honoring mankind. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu they, they said to the Prophet sallallahu if he speaks, everyone listens. Right? If he intercedes on someone's behalf, his intercession is granted. And if he was to propose to anyone, he could marry any girl that he wants. Prophet sallallahu said, okay. Another man walked by, very poor, very low in society. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, what do you say about this man? He said, ya Rasulullah, if he speaks, no one listens to him. No one cares what he has to say. And if he was to intercede, no one would care for his intercession. And no one would marry their daughter to him. And the Prophet ﷺ said what? The Prophet ﷺ says, the example of this person, Allah, in the sight of Allah, is better than the earth full of the example of that person. He's teaching them to shift their mindsets and the way they look at people and the way they look at themselves as well. Because they might think very highly of themselves. And you know what? If you are small in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care if you've got $140 shoes on or if you've got nice clothes on. If in the sight of Allah you are little, you are little. Ubadat ibn Samat radiallahu anhu, a very powerful dua that my shaykh taught me 
uh, when, when, I, when he first saw, you know, this is really awkward. My teacher called me because he saw my first video on YouTube. I was like, oh, man. He's like, taqillah, you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he reminded me of the statement. He said, you know, Ubadah radiallahu anhu was a very famous companion. He used to say, a'udhu billah an akun a'zeeman fi nafsi. An akun a'zeeman fi nafsi wa inda Allahi haqira. I seek refuge of Allah, in Allah, from seeing myself as great, but being very small in the sight of Allah. Meaning I look in the mirror and I say, MashaAllah, look at me. Right? But then in the sight of Allah, I'm nothing. And the Prophet Wasallam, every single time he had that opportunity to make that distinction, he did. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. How many of you have heard of the name of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu? Raise your hand if you've heard of his, this name. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, a great companion, great sahabi, a mountain in this religion. But you know what, subhanAllah, physically, he was very, very, very short. Very small. So small that when he's with the companions, the wind blows him into a tree. He's, he's, he's at the trunk of a tree and he's blown into that tree by the wind and his legs are exposed and the Sahaba laugh at him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't let that go. You know, by the way, the Prophet ﷺ was not one to stop people from laughing. Like you see this consistently throughout the seerah, he'd jump in ﷺ. He'd joke with them when he saw them joking and having fun. But not at the expense of this man's self-esteem. Rasulullah ﷺ said, what are you laughing about? So they knew it was serious. So the Rasulullah, his, his legs are so small. They're like twigs, right? Rasulullah he said, but those two legs in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment are the size of Uhud. How many of you have seen Mount Uhud? If you see mountain, the mountain of Uhud, one of the mountains of Jannah, it's a huge mountain. Rasulullah said, Ibn Mas'ud on the day of judgment will be walking and his legs will be the size of Uhud. You're talking about him, you don't know who he is. That's the attitude of the disbelievers. And interestingly enough, Ibn Mas'ud was the one who ended Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl was the size of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, a huge man. And when Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu climbed, he literally climbed up on top of him when he was laying down to finish him in the battle of Badr. And Abu Jahl is so arrogant, he looks up and he's like, this is who's going to kill me? This guy? <laughs> He said, you've, you've climbed the difficult mountain, Ya Ruwayy al Ghanam, you shepherd of sheep. Who do you think you are? You're going to kill me? Can you go call Umar al Khattab or someone great so at least I can go with some dignity? He's upset that Abdullah bin Mas'ud is killing him because Abdullah bin Mas'ud is so small. And he even asked Ibn Mas'ud, he says, Who's winning the battle right now? <laughs> and Ibn Mas'ud anhu says, Al Ghalaba to Lillah, Wali Rasulillah, Ya Adu Allah. Victory is to Allah and His Messenger, O enemy of Allah. And he was the one, subhanAllah, that, that, that took the life of Abu Jahl, who took the lives, of so, the lives of so many believers. Look at the confidence that was instilled in Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu just by being told by the Prophet sallallahu You know, Rasulullah sallallahu is saying this in front of him. His two legs are like the size of Uhud on the Day of Judgment. He's telling Ibn Mas'ud, even though as, as he's reprim reprimanding the Sahaba, he's telling Ibn Mas'ud as well, don't worry what they say about you, you're good. You're okay, don't worry about it. You're better than that. You're better than most of the companions. And this is a fact, Ibn Mas'ud is from the greatest of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He has such a status in this religion, it's, it's incredible. You know, when, when you go into uh, studying hadith, you see sometimes names and they're very strange. Like you'll see Abu al-Batan the father of the big stomach. It's a hadith narrator. Tufayl ibn Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. You find different narrators, different names. You see Abdullah. And there are over 300 Abdullahs from the Sahaba. But when it's just Abdullah, it's Ibn Mas'ud. Meaning what? It's, it's no need to even say Ibn Mas'ud. That's the greatness of this man in our religion. Do you think that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when he shows up on the Day of Judgment with his legs the size of the mountain of Uhud, will be thinking to himself, yeah, this is great, but I wish I could have you know, been a little bit taller in dunya. You think he cares? You think it matters to him at all? Maybe it was, again, the humility that he experienced because of the, of the, of the, uh, you know, the ridicule that he went through in life, maybe that's what led, contributed to his, to his tawadu, or to his good adab, to his good iman. Maybe that's what contributed to it. That's all that mattered. And so when the Prophet ﷺ says to you, Inna Allah la yanzuru, Allah does not look ila suwarikum wa ila ajsadikum. Allah doesn't look at your faces. He doesn't look at your bodies. He actually says it in the present tense, alayhi salatu wasalam. Not 
Allah will not look at your faces and your bodies. He says, Inna Allah la yandru. Allah does not look at your faces or your bodies, but instead, yandru ila qulubikum. He looks at your hearts. He looks at your hearts. That's what matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that matter? That, does that mean that I can tattoo myself and you know, do whatever I want and, and, and you know, dress any way that I want and it doesn't matter because I'll just say I have a good heart? No. What the Prophet is talking about is your status. Rasulullah is not, it's clear from the context of the hadith, the Prophet is not talking about you know, your, 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 uh, your deeds here. He's talking about your status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart and what comes from the heart, which at times affects the body. So Rasulullah is setting that stage for us at a very, very early, uh, at a, at a very, very early period in Islam for the Sahaba that were deeply you know, engulfed in tribalism and in, in classism and, and these, these, these silly litmus tests for one status in society. Now here's the thing, and this is where I really want to put it to you. This is where I, the take-home message that I want for all of you to take home is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, ضَعُفَ الطَّارِبُ وَالْمَطْلُوبُ The one who is sought and the one that was seeking have become weakened, have become small. Meaning what? Even if people approve of the way you look, even if people think that you know, this, your new Facebook profile picture is awesome, your cover photo is great, your clothes are great, you look beautiful today, even if people say that about you, what have you earned in life? What have you gotten? And subhanAllah, you will weaken yourself because you'll never be good enough because they'll always find something to point at. You'll never be able to satisfy everyone. People will always find something wrong with you. And at the same time, who are, whose approval and whose pleasure are you seeking? Who's going to answer your call when you're in need anyway? Who's going to be there for you when you need them? Is there any God besides Allah? Meaning, is there anyone to be sought other than Allah? What are you getting out of it? And the fact of the matter is, in, that, in the 21st century, people are more concerned with the illusion of being happy than actually experiencing happiness. It's more important that everyone around me thinks I'm happy than actually being happy. It's more important that everyone around me thinks I'm beautiful than actually feeling beauty. And so, you know, I was reading an interesting study and it blew my mind, but I can see how it's true. That one of the criteria, one of the things that you go through as you're, uh, as, as you're looking for a spouse, a lot of people will actually think, this will actually be part of the decision-making process, how good is he going to look with me on my Facebook cover photo? <laughs> what are people going to say? How are the wedding pictures going to come out? Can you imagine that? People will actually think, how are the wedding pictures going to come out? What are people going to say? Right? When we, when we get online and we have that thing one and thing two shirt, and I'm his and I'm hers and all that weird corny stuff that happens in the first month of marriage, and then all of a sudden the pictures disappear. And it's like, oh man, what happened? Right? Because you're putting your life out there, subhanAllah. And you know, at the end of the day, people actually, that's actually part of their decision-making process. What are people going to say? How many, how many likes will I get for that? What, what will people think of me? And, and you know, we're laughing about it, but it's true. And, and you know, it might be true for some of us as well. And so what I want you all to think about, when you get up in the morning and you look at yourself, the first question that comes to your mind should be, how does Allah see me right now? How do I look in the sight of Allah right now? Not how will I look on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, you know, that's, that, that is in its own time, in its own place, and we'll have to deal with that when it comes, and it could be very, very, very soon. I'm not saying put it off. I'm saying now, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that goes through my head before, what will people say? And how in fashion am I? And how will, pe will people approve of the way that I look? Or will people think I'm beautiful? The first question should be, is Allah pleased with me right now? If Allah, Allah is looking at me right now, is Allah pleased with me right now? Does Allah like the way I look? And when you put on your clothes, the first thing that should come to your mind is what? Alhamdulillahi ladhi kasani hadha thaw min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwa. The first thing you do is thank Allah. Before you say, what's wrong with it? And like, oh, there's, you know, it's not, it's not what I expected it to be. And last time I put it in the washer dryer, it went through this and it's no longer. The first thing that should come to your mind is Alhamdulillahi ladhi kasani hadha thaw. All praises be to Allah who gave me this garment min ghayri hawla minni wa la quwa, with no doing or no power of my own. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said the reward of saying that dua is? Anybody know? Anybody? 
Rasulullah said, whoever says that when they put on their clothes, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ دَنْبِهِ He will be forgiven for all of his previous sins. That acknowledgement of Allah's perfection and Allah's ni'mah upon you, His blessing upon you, not complaining about anything, just being grateful and thankful, being conscious of Allah even as you wear your clothes, as you start your day, and your image in the sight of Allah is your greatest priority, that is enough to have all of your previous sins forgiven. And subhanAllah, the, the empowerment of Islam, wallahi, Islam empowers you. Islam empowers you, men and women, because I'm not sure if it was covered. Haya applies to men and women. So guys that are online, I always because I always have these weird people that, that, that argue on my Facebook page. And I have to admit, you know, someone said this, Hafidahullah uh, Ta'ala, Umar Usman, when he said that Facebook comments are the new, new YouTube comments. I'm like, that is so true. Just the most ridiculous and outrageous comments on Facebook, right? So I often have people like, a sister will comment and she's not wearing hijab. And then it's totally unrelated. A brother will jump on and reply to her and the brother will say, sister, how dare you speak? You need to go wear hijab first. And he'll start commenting on all the other pictures on her Facebook profile. And what's that brother doing? He's chilling in Cancun on a beach with his shirt off, right? And I'm like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this. Haya applies to men and women. Islam is empowering because Islam really makes you not care. Not that I want to tell people that I don't care because, you know, that... You know, that, that, that attitude of, am I done or five minutes? Five minutes, okay. That attitude of, I want to project a feeling of not caring is in and of itself caring. You know what I'm saying? Like when, you, when you're putting up images to show people that you don't care, to portray, to portray yourself as a rebel, you're actually telling people that you do care. <laughs> you actually care very much about their opinion of you. You just want it to be a negative opinion so that you can feel empowered by that. It still says something about your security. It still says that you are pursuing a perception. You're marketing yourself, right? You're trying to sell a certain image of yourself. Allah Azza wa Jal wants to free us from all of that. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala wants to free us from all of that. One of the most powerful poems, beautiful sayings. إِذَا صَحَّ مِنْكَ الْوُدُّ فَالْكُلُّ هَيِّنٌ فَكُلُّ الَّذِي فَوْقَ التُرَابِ تُرَابُ It's a saying that's been attributed to Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah ta'ala that if I have attained your love, O oh Allah, then everything is worthless because everything that has been created from dirt is dirt in and of itself. And everything that's on top of this dirt is dirt in and of itself. Meaning people are dirt, I don't care for their opinion. As long as you're satisfied, I am pleased. And you know, I'll tell this story. And when I saw the, the, the title, I was like, I'm gonna tell this story. And I've told this story at like the last three ISNA conventions, but I have to tell it because it matches the topic. The girl in France. How many of you have heard the story of the girl in France from me? Oh, mashallah, not many of you at all. Go for it. Uh, the, the hijab ban that took place in France, I believe it was in 2003 or 2004, when Jacques Chirac, when he banned hijab in public schools uh, in France, there was a, a young girl by the name of Sunnat Dujani. Um, she's 16 years old, a French girl, and she, she caught news headlines because she shaved her head. Now, subhanAllah, she shaved her head and she went to school and it became a huge thing because she said, hey, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing, right? And she goes to school. And the reporters are actually in front of her school. She's a teenage girl. And they're bombarding her with questions because this set off such, a, you know, such, such media waves because of her action, because this was so different. And she was actually French. She wasn't Algerian or Moroccan. She's actually French, right? So why would you do this? And they saw it as betrayal. So they would interview her as she was going in. And one of the interviewers caught her as she was going in. And she said, if the system is not going to respect me, I'm not going to respect the system. And walked off like a boss. Like seriously, like just drop the mic and walk. You know, somehow I was like, oh my God, that's so powerful and profound. You're not going to respect me, I'm not going to respect you. Gone. It's like that. Imagine the confidence. Now, when she went to school, you know what she went through? Teachers ridiculing her, friends making fun of her, people saying all kinds of things to her and about her. She spent the entire day being ridiculed. When she got out of school, she had a big smile on her face, and the reporter got back to her again and told her, how do you feel? You know, and, and you could actually hear the jeering in the back. And she said, if, if being beautiful in the sight of the Creator means being ugly in the sight of the creation, then it's worth it. Mind-blowing, subhanAllah. I was like, oh my God. That's not a saying of Rasulullah That's not a poem from the Sahaba or the Tabi'een. 
that girl, and it's not even about hijab here, it's about empowerment, like how empowered she felt by her deen. Like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Allah sees me as beautiful. I don't care if people think I'm ugly. And wallahi, all of us bear witness that she's beautiful because of that. That's beauty. SubhanAllah, that is beauty. For her to do that, wallahi, I admire her. She's an inspiration to me. I admire her. Why? Because I wish I could have that sense of security and that sense of stability inside of me. Now, this isn't to beat everyone down and I'm done. My time is up. What I want to remind you all to do, inshallah ta'ala, just when you wake up in the morning, and it's all, subhanAllah, everything is tied together. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that you make dua when you wear your clothes. As soon as you find yourself becoming ungrateful or pursuing someone else's pleasure, do something that would cause you to not gain their pleasure and their approval. Do something out of the ordinary. All right? Uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that I had a good friend of mine. And he said what I admired about him, that... Uh, Whenever he was faced with, with a difficult decision, he would look to which one is closer to his self, to his ego, to his desires, and he would uh, contradict it. <laughs> Meaning when he didn't want to speak, he spoke, and when he wanted to speak, he remained silent. Fight your nafs. At the end of the day, it's a battle with your nafs. It's a battle with your lower self. right? And it's difficult. It's hard to be Muslim. It's hard... To, to, it, you know, and, it's, and it goes far beyond body image. It's hard to not do certain things that your non-Muslim friends are doing, to be that odd man out. But don't just accept your difference, embrace it. Be proud of it. And wallahi, when you respect yourself, other people around you will respect you more. I remember, when because I wasn't always very religious, and I shouldn't say that, but I actually, I wasn't always very religious, and especially, I used to play varsity basketball, and then all of a sudden I went through my religious phase and things of that sort. And so people initially would mock me, and it just didn't get to me. And subhanAllah, what I saw is that when I didn't respond to that, and in fact, I responded, I'd make a joke back at them and I'd just show them that it wasn't bothering me. I wouldn't even just look at them like upset and like walk away. Plus I was bigger than them so I could still beat them up if, they, uh, <laughs> if I wanted to, but part of it was fear. But, but really, I mean, what, what I would do is I would, just, I would just embrace it, I'd laugh about it, I'd make a joke about it and they'd forget about it. And then subhanAllah, you know, people would come up to me and they'd start asking me all these questions. And wallahi, there's a, there's a famous rapper that I went to high school with. I will not share his name here because the last time I shared his name, people were like, I mean, basically everyone just rolled, rolled on, you know, people were, it was literally R-O-F-L in the audience. I was like, man, this is what it looks like, right? Everyone just fell on the ground, started laughing, and I couldn't even finish my lecture. So I'm not even going to tell you guys the name of the rapper. A famous... Oh, no. Is that Hayya al Salah? You guys here? Is it Maghrib time? <laughs> no, even his name sounds funny. So, I don't even know. You know, he's a southern rapper, though. So, I don't know if you guys know southern rappers. You, oh, you do know southern rappers? Astaghfirullah. <laughs> That's terrible. Like, all of you are like, yeah, we know who they are. You know? Anyway, there was a rapper that I used to do da'wah to. As subhanAllah, I brought him to the masjid a few times as well. And he used, to always, he used to say that, you know, he used to express his desire to be Muslim. And if you listen to Napoleon and, and his experiences with Tupac and the outlaws and things of that sort, you'll find that even, subhanAllah, people that are deeply concerned with their image, that live for their image essentially, and make a life, make their living off of their image, feel empty. You know, I talked to Hussein Abdullah. He's a good friend of mine. He plays, by the way, the Kansas City Chiefs are America's Muslim team now. Let me tell you why. Two of my good friends, two good brothers, Hussein Abdullah plays safety for them. And Ryan Harris, who's also a Muslim, has an incredible convert story. He plays off, he's an offensive lineman for the Kansas City Chiefs now. So I don't care who your team is. You've got to root for, I'm a Saints fan. I'm a huge Saints fan. I'm rooting for the Chiefs. All right. So you got to root for the Chiefs. Wow. MashaAllah. That's like creeping Sharia though, right? Two, two Muslim players on the same team. But subhanAllah, you know, he, he, every time I talk to him, he just tells me how empty the players are. Like with all the muscles and all the women throwing themselves at them and all the money, they're empty, empty, insecure. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Allah tatma'inna al Don't hearts find rest in the remembrance of Allah. Nothing else will settle your heart. Nothing else will grant you tranquility. And nothing else will grant you peace. All right, the name of the rapper. How many of you have heard of Lil Busi? Astaghfirullah wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.